Ah, yeah, okay. Hello, good evening. I'm Shudeep Sen from Delhi. And I'm Fiona Sampson and I'm on the borders of Wales. Welcome all of you. Uh, it's, uh, it's a strange time, but it's just so good to see everybody smiling. This is sort of, I, I, I said in the email, I think, you know, a sort of one and a half hour window of sunshine for many of us, just to see from smiling faces. So welcome, uh, Knut. Pia, Manuel, we are really, really looking forward to hearing you and talking with you. And so many repeat uh, attendees. That's the wonderful thing. So many of you come back. So it's wonderful to see you all. Yes, welcome everybody. And um, I think all through lockdown so far, this has been a sense of the poetry community continuing. Even if we can't be in the same room together, we can be in the same Zoom room together. And it's really important to stay connected at a time like this. So. So, so the reading order is Pia first and then uh, Emmanuel and then Knut. Uh, please keep your chat box uh, on your right of the screen active because that's where I put the bios. Sometimes I put the poems. Today, of course, the poems will be screened on the, on the main screen. And you can put your details such as websites, new books coming out. So feel free to you know, ex uh, exploit that chat box. Uh, it's quite, been quite useful. So we start with Pia. Pia, welcome. It's so good to see you. Uh, yeah. Really lovely as always. And I've put your bio on the side, but I will read it out formally. Pia Tavdrup is a Danish poet and writer, member of the Danish Academy since 1989. She has received the Nordic Council's Literature Prize in 1999 and the Nordic Prize in 2006 from the Swedish Academy. Pia has published 19 collections of poetry. Recent ones in England are Queen's Gate, Tarkovsky's Horses, another poem, and Salamander Sun, and other poems. The four recent books in Denmark are The Taste of Steel, the Smell of Snow, Sight of Light, The Sound of Clouds. In spring 2021, The Taste of Steel and The Smell of Snow as one volume will be published by Blood Axe. She has also published a statement of her poetics, Walking Over Water, two plays, two novels, her poems are translated into more than 30 languages in books, magazines, and anthologies. And she lives in this beautiful space, as you can see, in Copenhagen. Pia, oh, a very, very warm welcome. Welcome, Pia. It's such a joy to have invited you. I was so glad that I was able to invite you to launch at the moment that your beautiful volume has just arrived on, on my British bookshelf. It's a really, uh -huh. it's a really happy coincidence that we've managed to coincide with the book. Um, Pierre yeah. is a writer who I have admired enormously for, well, years and years, and has been a tremendous role model for me, as I think she has been for a lot of poets, particularly perhaps women poets, because she's such a powerful writer, as well as an extraordinary one. I can't wait for this reading. Thank you so much, Pierre. Thank you to both of you, Sudeep and Fiona for inviting me and uh, yes it's true since i sent uh, the bio to you the the book has arrived and mm -hmm. i i read uh, from this book it was published by by blood x and um it con this volume contains both 
the taste of steel and the smell of snow. And I will uh, read the first poem I read in uh, Danish, and then I read uh, in David Macduff's translations. Stadia på livets vej. Din elskerinde, der knuste sukkerskålen, er jeg efterhånden ret ligeglad med. Havet vibrerer ikke længere over at have set dig død beruset af forelskelse, men sukkerskålen, som jeg havde arvet fra min mormor, den mangler stadig, hver gang jeg rækker en hånd ind i skabet og Søren Kirkegaards stadier på livets vej, som jeg var ved at læse, har hun spillet kaffe på. Bare to sten i den mosaik af ulykker, hun højlydt har forårsaget i det, jeg stålsat troede var mit hjem. Stages on life's way. Your lover who broke the sugar bowl, I'm gradually quite indifferent about. The hate doesn't vibrate anymore at having seen you dead drunk with infatuation. But the sugar bowl I inherited from my mother's mother, it's still missing every time I put my hand in the cupboard and Soran Kierkegaard's stages on life's way, which I was reading, she has spilled coffee on. Just two pieces in the mosaic of disasters she has loudly caused in what was steely resolve I thought was my home. View from space, from the sixth planet from the sun in our solar system where the Cassini space probe trains its camera lens on the earth, it's visible merely in a small white dot. That's where I live far away. That's where my cat today has seen a deer for the first time. That's where the cat probably thought it had landed on an alien planet. In NASA's image, the Earth is photographed from just 10 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. I'm close to Saturn and its rings of stone and ice. A gigantic silence reigns here. I see the Earth from outer space, see the bright glowing dot That's where I live. That's where we live. That's where we live as if we were the center of the universe. That's where butterflies hover over the grass. That's where we ceaselessly produce more weapons, practice battle tactics, turn our everyday life into a night of hell. That's where I obliterate That's where I'm annihilated. The taste buds wake up. There isn't much that doesn't taste of anything. Broken glass has a taste. The bread of angels, paper, unrequited love, the cry from the throat. The taste buds are there to enjoy, to distinguish between fresh and stale, between sweet and sour, salt and bitter, and umami that sets off other tastes. The taste is more than an electric impulse. It is the recognition of mother's milk, my blood, my sweat, my tears, and other chemical molecules, your skin, your sex. With 10,000 taste buds on the tongue, each with about 1,000 receptors, taste will not let itself be overcome. 
the water I drink tastes of the water of Østerbro, as wine has a taste of vintage and locality, which can make it so surprisingly good that I get lost in the streets far from my neighborhood. There isn't much that has no taste of something. Broken glass has a taste, the bread of angels, paper, requited love, the cry from the throat. And then I read from The Smell of Snow. Uh, the opening poem is called Spirit. I breathe in snowy air, breathe in a universe. The snow falls, dances between trees, dances under street lamps, light cones. The snow has lost the sky. The snow whirls through space. I breathe in cold, breathe in purity. The snow is rest for the soul. Thoughts rise up expand while each flake seeks its casual center in the world. The snowy sky settles on the earth. Something reaches out across the body's limit. Something exists that's greater than I can grasp, merely sense. The snowy sky settles over my heart. I breathe in the air that bind us together to each other. Spirit is noticed when it's present, touches us with a wingtip, a puff of wind, a wave of mist, leaves its mark of elevation when it suddenly arrives. Spirit is joined to my consciousness, but also greater than it, Spirit can reach the consciousness of all. It's there between us. We talk together, understand each other in glimpses, reach into each other's lives by means miraculous or barbaric. Words are breathing out and in. I breathe in the smell of snow, breathe out, breathe in like you. Smell blind. It's strange, but I don't remember your smell when you are not here, you said. That reply made me put the perfume away for a long time. That you couldn't distinguish one woman's fragrance from another hadn't dawned on me yet. My nose to your throat and just I sniffed your scent as a dog plows its muscle through the autumn leaves. My soul is full of smells. I loved your scent. It hung not only in the air where you had been, it existed like an echo in my memory, as if lightning had struck there. Without the perfume, my skin smells again of me, and the poems I write may very well smell of skin, for of all conceivable lives, I prefer this one. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. The primordial brain, unmistakable smell of fire, the instinct intact, even immersed in sleep, the smell, a heart flick like a whiplash, shakes the heart, keeps the soul prisoner. Even a burnt slice of bread in the toaster sounds a black alarm. The primordial brain reacts intuitively, recognizes in a split second the stinging smell of smoke as smoke. Smell of something burned, smell of soot. An evolution of more than 100 million years since the fire gives us a nose for just that smell. Burned out, burned down, shard, piercing black prisons always. And the last poem I read 
is the end of icebergs. I breathe in, in the dry air, fill my lungs with a universe, breathe an inner space out again. The smell of icebergs broken from glaciers in deep fjords under the raw sky hangs in the nostrils. Frost flies under the sun. An iceberg sticks up through the sea's surface. The young icebergs, a couple of thousand years old, the older ones with hundreds of thousands of years behind them. Snowflake on snowflake, each with its unique structure have become compressed, sleepless snow, become mountains of ice, formations widely different from other formations. An iceberg gaps and gapes, forms, slits and cracks, breaks as if struck by an invisible wedge. A giant colossus falls. My chest opens out, I breathe in, breathe out again. My breathing space connects with the world, forms a bridge. I spread along airways out into the space. The mountains of ice collapse. The words snow and ice don't exist in Hebrew. Here one must find other words when the snow falls. But what alternatives refer to sleet, drifting snow, snow drifts, another phenomena. I straighten my back, smell the world, gather a multitude of smells at once. The mountains of ice collapse on hot days, white ice colors, gray, turquoise, blue, crumbled blocks, rock and toss, turns their bottoms up like creatures in a struggle for survival, roll around and around in the water, run with the flow, melt down to uniform drops in the open sea that rises trans-oceanic, wipes all traces of the ice's history. Thank you. Bravo. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much, Pierre. As ever, so forensic, so delving. You just don't let us off the hook at all. And every poem is a kind of step, step, step further into kind of these revelations of insight and wisdom. You're so courageous. You, you, you're as forensic about the inner world as about the outer. You conscious of holding the two in tension. We can talk about that later because it has exactly with the senses to do what you just yeah. say here, yeah. Yes, and also that what Fiona just said is reflected on the cover itself, the image. If you think of that steel cable, yeah. you know, with the ice around it. It's, it's a, it is, together, a, is a, who found this, uh, and I mean, um, two books in one, it can be difficult to illustrate, but I, I really admire this photo I he found. A beautiful job. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it sort of illustrates a lot of the things, issues. You know, one of the things I want to ask you, Pia, I, I've read all your poetry in the English translation, of course. I've heard you read in so many places and mm. so on. There's a lovely shift to, your poems are fairly sparse, but there's even sparser now you're playing with a lot more white space. Of course, I'm only thinking of the translation and the translations are excellent. Would you like to talk a little bit about the structure, uh, about the structure of your poems and the fact that you've moved away and become much more spare? Yeah, I, I, I would like to answer you, but uh, what about the other poets? I thought that we should start reading all of us and then talk a little. No, don't, don't worry, Pierre. It's fine. What we do, because it's on Zoom and because it's international and so people's language, people get their ear in. I mean, you, the poets, get your ear in. We yeah. respond a little bit like this. 
okay. um, rather than trying to have a formal panel. So please don't feel inhibited. And it's our responsibility to keep an eye on the time, not yours. So, you know, please well, make yourself well, at yes. home. Yeah. You asked these questions. I was thinking of uh, a painting I saw by Gerhard Richter in Cologne uh, years ago when I just had started this. Uh, I came into a huge uh, room in the museum where there was only one painting and it uh, uh, consisted of five open doors, just a little open, and there was nothing behind. And when I saw this, I thought, wow, it's exactly, uh, it's a painting about the five senses. <laughs> I mean, you also always go to art with what you have inside you. So uh, perhaps Gerhard Richter wanted to show that there was nothing behind these open doors. Perhaps he wants to illustrate uh, the invisible, the uh, nothingness. I don't know, but I began to fill in and I thought, five open doors that's exactly what i'm working with these years uh, our senses open up uh, for the the world and i mean small things can come in but also the the huge world like uh, this time i'm talking about icebergs and many uh, impressions i've had uh, when i visited svalbard and other places which Greenland, it made a huge impression on me. And, and it has so much to do with breath. So these, uh, uh, these uh, poems about climate suddenly entered in, uh, in the book about senses. So uh, I, you, we have a small de details about the, the perfume, uh, the woman had Last to- bowl. Yeah, and then icebergs melting. So I mean, that's the wonderful thing about poetry. We can have the concentrate on the small thing and sometimes it's more difficult to open up for, uh, for global stuff. It, 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 it's uh, rather difficult to do that, but sometimes uh, uh, we manage. <laughs> uh, wonderfully. And I think one of the things that I absolutely love about these books is that you could have been just rather another, less, a lesser poet would have just been rather systematic. And instead with you, we feel this sense of an opportunity to be not comprehensive, but comprehending and generous, but it's not a system, it's not a game. They are the doors into experience. Yeah, but uh, in a way, the five books, uh, it's a kind of system this time. And in that way, uh, <clears throat> they are very different from what I have uh, been writing before, but it's a very, very easy system. I uh, hear I'm sitting with my five fingers. Uh, uh, five is a number belonging to the body. And uh, I, I just stick to the five senses. Some will say we have many more, but I stick to the classical five uh, senses and uh, we have uh, we will have five books in the end i'm writing on the fifth one and uh, each book contains 55 uh, poems because i want to balance between the uh, the senses uh, in our culture the the sight is it's almost about the sight and mm -hmm. uh, the hearing uh, is also important but I, the, the so-called small senses like uh, the taste and the uh, and the touch and yeah and the touch and uh, the smell uh, these small which only occupies four percent of the brain in fact uh, they are so important it they have so much to do with survival uh, so they, I find them so important and perhaps more challenging to, to write about because uh, uh, the philosophers have already said so much about the site, for example. Yes, I just I, want to ask you, sorry, go on, go on, Shadeep. No, yes, you know, we were talking about uh, the poems being very, very forensic is a beautiful word with uh, piano use. So it's both very local and global. And part of that happens because of the context. I was just remembering the a line, I won't be able to quote it, uh, but I was remembering the line from your first poem, 
hate doesn't hate doesn't bother me anymore oh, and yeah. i'm thinking about hate <laughs> in a contemporary context of course your context was different that's the beauty of you know well crafted poetry that it actually transcends its original meaning and takes on so many other robes that you can yeah. put on that's yeah. that's true you ha you you really need a certain distance to hate when it should not be alarming anymore it's almost a funny poem about about hatred <laughs> but it took very long time to uh, uh, come to that uh. i know it's one of the early poems in the book but it's one of my favorite because one goes yes there's such an aha reading it <laughs> yeah I think I couldn't laugh at that time, but uh, no. well, this is such a wonderful way to start this afternoon session. Thank you so much, Pierre. Um, it's always sort of strange and vertiginous now to step into the completely different sound world and conceptual world of another poet, and um, but nevertheless, we're going to so. Um, for now, let's um, turn to Manuel. It's a great pleasure to welcome also Manuel Iris. And um, I should just say that uh, I think I've said this to each of our poets who are reading separately, but I must confess it altogether that I think that, in fact, translation was a foolish theme to choose for three poets of such stature, because, of course, they're going to be working with translation and be translated um, because they have international reputations. I think really what binds these three poets together is that their profound emotional intelligence in their work. And where um, at the, I want to say that perhaps Pia is um, a phenomenologist at the moment. I think of Manuel as a kind of, I hope you won't hate me saying this, Manuel, a kind of domestic philosopher who's old beyond his years. Um, I just find his poetry extraordinarily wise. We met in um, Albania and Macedonia, where else does one meet poets, um, two years ago at a festival. And Manuel, who was born in Mexico in 1983, is a Mexican poet, but he's living in the States, where he is poet laureate emeritus. That's to say, he was, when I met him, poet laureate of the city of Cincinnati, which is where he lives and where he's a professor at the university. He received the Merida National Award of Poetry in Mexico for his book, Notebook of Dreams in 2009 and the Rodolfo Figuera Regional Award for The Disguises of Fire in 2014. In 2016, two different anthologies were published, The Naked Light in Venezuela and Before the Mystery in El Salvador. His first bilingual collection, um, Translating Silence, was published in New York in 2018 and the book won two different awards in the International Latino Book Awards in LA that same year. Iris has published poetry, essay, and translation in magazines and literary journals from Mexico, Spain, Chile, Cuba, Colombia, Portugal, France, the US, and Angola. His poetry has been included in several Mexican and Latin American and American poetry anthologies. He's given talks, lectures, poetry readings, in literary events, conferences, and cultural centers uh, in North and South America and Europe. He holds a BA in Latin American literature from the Autonomous University of Yucatan, an MA in Spanish from the New Mexico State University, and a PhD in Romance Language from the University of Cincinnati, which is, as I think I just said, where he lives. Um, I should um, declare a personal interest that Manuel and I work together on translation. It's a real pleasure to introduce Manuel. Hello. Thank you, Fiona. Welcome for that uh, undeserved introduction. Um, I'm going to read poems from my two bilingual coll collections. Um, as I said at the beginning, I am my own translator, which has been a whole a change in the way I write. Um, because translating became part of my editing process. Now, Oftentimes, when I'm translating myself into English, I like what is happening in the translation more than what happened in the original, and I go back and change the original. So now translation has become a part of the revision because I think that there is no a closer reading of a text than the translation of a text. Um, when you tr translate, you read word by word and not idea by idea. And, and that care 
um, helps me at least to to understand my own work sometimes. I'm going to start um, this reading and I'm going to read every poem in English first and then I will read it in Spanish, which is the language in which I write. So when I read it in Spanish, you know what I'm talking about. Um, this poem is called Ars Poetica. Stubborn, the yellow leaf does not let go of the branch. I watch her battle against wind and rain, against gravity. For days I've been watching her quiet effort, her tiny tragedy. Her persistence does not deserve oblivion. That is why I put her here in this verse from which she will not fall. Arte Poetica. Terca, la hoja amarilla no se suelta de la rama. La observo en su disputa contra el viento y la lluvia, contra la gravedad. Llevo días mirando su callado esfuerzo, su tragedia diminuta. Su persistencia no merece olvido. Es por eso que la he puesto aquí, en este verso, del que no caerá. Um, I think there is a theme of memory in the poems um, that I that I chose for today. I am indeed writing a lot about memory and life and death. I'm going to read a very short poem called Small Poem Obsess, well, Testigo. There we go, Testigo. This is a poem about, again, keeping the memory of things that are dear to me. This is a poem about observing my wife's pregnancy and just being a witness because there is not much I can do in those circumstances. Your daughter is dancing, says my wife, touching her belly. For the past five months, I've been a witness of what happens there under her hands. My wife is a house inside my house and I am outside of my own heart. I am sure she's happy, she says, and I would give up poetry in exchange for having inside me, my daughter, for feeling that dance that bonds them to all beginnings. But the option does not exist and I do what I can, cooking, fulfilling cravings, writing a poem in which I say what I can see from this side of the skin in which mystery embodies itself. And I testify with loving envy that an everyday miracle is a miracle and nothing less. Ahora, en español, Woo! testigo. Beautiful. Thank you. Testigo. Está bailando tu hija, dice mi esposa, y se toca la barriga. Desde hace varios meses soy testigo de lo que sucede ahí, debajo de sus manos. Mi esposa es una cansa dentro de mi casa y yo estoy fuera de mi propio corazón. Seguro está contenta, dice, y yo sería capaz de renunciar a la poesía a cambio de tener dentro de mí a mi hija, de sentir la danza que las une a todos los principios. Pero la opción no existe y hago lo que puedo. Cocinar, solucionar antojos, escribir el poema en el que digo lo que veo desde este lado de la piel en que se encarna el misterio. Y testimonio, con absoluta envidia, que un milagro tantas veces repetido es un milagro y nada menos. I chose uh, for these readings poems that are very close to people and memories that I love. The next poem is also a, about these memories. This is a poem about being a migrant. I am a poet that is born in Mexico, lives in the United States, but now the United States is my house. So when I'm here, I miss Mexico. And when I'm there, I miss my people from here. So I wrote this poem called, I am from here. 
One is from the places that he has arrived, from the language in which he cannot dream, and one day it happens, and he wakes up wondering which one is now his house, when there is always a heart elsewhere. One comes from the streets that never are the same when he returns. One comes from the moment in which he decided to leave and from that other one in which he realizes that everything departs, that it's impossible to stay even if you stay, that it's impossible even if you come back to be back. I write a verse that is like a farewell and point at it. I am from here. En español el poema se titula Soy de aquí. Soy de aquí. Uno es de los sitios a los que ha llegado, del idioma en el que no puede soñar y un día sucede y se despierta preguntándose cuál es su casa ahora, cuando siempre hay corazón en otra parte. Uno proviene de las calles que ya nunca son las mismas al volver. Proviene del momento en el que decidió partir y de ese otro en el que entiende que todo se aleja, que es imposible quedarse aunque te quedes, que es imposible aunque regreses, regresar. Escribo un verso que es como una despedida y lo señalo. Soy de aquí. Um, the poem that comes next is a poem about my grandmother who is the person that has loved me the most until at Heitzmer's talk, took her mind and she started confusing me with the men that abandoned her with five children. The poem is called Echoes. Echoes. Beaten by her age, my grandmother talks to the previous one that saw her through my eyes. Didn't it ever hurt you leaving me like this with five children? You never thought about us. I feel guilty of the silence that my face before myself kept, but I clarify my love. I am your grandson, the first child of your youngest son. I am the one who lives far away. I was going to say, she tells me, that it didn't make sense that I was so old and you remain the same. She hugs me with relief, as if this conversation between us was over, but it will happen as usual the next time we see each other. Ecos. Mordida por su edad, mi abuela le habla a la anterior que la vio por mis ojos. No te dolió jamás dejarme así, con cinco niños. No nos pensabas nunca. Me siento culpable del silencio que mi rostro antes de mí guardó. Pero le aclaro, amor, yo soy tu nieto, el primer hijo de tu hijo menor. Soy el que vive lejos. Ya decía yo, me dice, que no tenía sentido que yo fuera una vieja y tú siguieras igual. Me abraza con alivio, como si esa conversación entre nosotros acabara, pero sucederá, como es costumbre, la siguiente vez que nos veamos. Um, these are all uh, very personal poems. I think that the next one, if I am not mistaken, um, oh no, I thought that it was one about my daughter, but this is a really short poem. Um, I am a poet that believes that the body is the link between this world and transcendence. And that is what this poem tries to try to talk about. Little poem obsessed with death. To get out of the house, we build a house. To get out of the body, the lovers undress. To dream, we sleep. For the silence to sprout, the poem opens its wound. Pequeño poema obsesionado con la muerte. Para salir de casa, construimos la casa. Para salir del cuerpo, se desnudan los amantes. Para soñar, dormimos. Para que brote el silencio, 
abre su herida el poema. I think I'm going to read just two more poems. I don't want to pull you all to sleep. You're not putting us to sleep at all, Manuel. This is um, when my daughter was born, and I'm sorry if I if I if I tell the anecdote on this poem, but when my daughter was born, which was three years ago, um, I wanted to write a letter for her just in case, just in case I was not here forever. I want her to have something for me. Letter to my newborn daughter to help her christen the world. Now that the world is brand new, I want to go out to the balcony with you and tell you, this is a tree, this is a leaf, and that jumping on that branch is a fruit, is a bird, a flower. It is the song of the bird, it is the air. But someday you're going to ask me of love and war, of hope and death, of why we came to be born precisely now, precisely here, and those answers I also ignore. Instead, I offer you my little certainties. Everything is in sight if you pay attention to the little things. There is more truth in an embrace than in a book. Everything in the world is dark and vital, like a root, beautiful and destructive, like a wildfire. You must live without fearing death, your own or others. We need it to return to the beginning. Now that the world is completely new, I give you also these two amulets so you can save them or wear them in your hair. Silence is music. I love you. Ahora, en español. Carta a mi hija recién nacida para ayudarla a inaugurar el mundo. Ahora que el mundo es completamente nuevo, quiero salir contigo al balcón y decirte, esto es un árbol, esto una hoja, y eso que brinca encima de esa rama es una fruta, un pájaro, una flor, es la canción del pájaro, es el aire. Pero algún día vas a preguntarme del amor y la guerra, la esperanza y la muerte, del por qué venimos a nacer precisamente ahora, precisamente aquí, y esas respuestas yo también las desconozco. En su lugar te ofrezco mis pequeñas certezas. Todo está a la vista si prestas atención a las cosas pequeñas. Hay más verdad en un abrazo que en un libro. Todo en el mundo es oscuro y vital como raíz, hermoso y destructivo como un incendio. Debes vivir la vida sin temor a la muerte, tuya o ajena. Es necesaria para volver al inicio. Ahora que el mundo es completamente nuevo, te regalo también estos dos amuletos para que puedas guardarlos o llevarlos en tu pelo. El silencio es la música. Te amo. I could end the reading here if you guys think that this is enough. I think there are one or two more poems. At least one me. more. One more, Manuel, please. Okay. Lovely. Yeah. One more. Well, this is also a poem of immigrant, of being an immigrant. When my father died recently. I wasn't able to go to his burial. So I wrote this poem called Elegy and Welcome for My Father, whose funeral I could not attend. I was always afraid to write, I woke up today, Father, in a world where you no longer exist. But it turns out that sometimes death is the consolation of immigrants. Today, we beat the phone calls and the airports. Today you enter my house. Perhaps that's why I am scared of going back, of watching the afternoon without you there. I don't want to see your grave. I don't want you to have a grave, but I will go. I'm going to look at it and then I will keep talking with you. 
Now as I write, I am again the boy who raises his hand seeking for yours. Father, this morning you did not wake up and I do not say goodbye. Today, you enter my house. En español, dice, elegía y bienvenida para mi padre a cuyo entierro no pude acudir. Siempre tuve miedo de escribir. Hoy desperté, papá, en un mundo en el que ya no existes. Pero resulta que a veces la muerte es el consuelo de los inmigrantes. Hoy superamos el teléfono y los aeropuertos. Hoy entras a mi casa. Quizá por eso tengo miedo de volver, de ver la tarde sin que tú la ocupes. No quiero ver tu tumba. No quiero que tengas una tumba, pero voy a ir. Voy a mirarla y después voy a seguir hablando contigo. Ahora que escribo, soy de nuevo el niño que levanta la mano buscando la tuya. Papá, esta mañana no te despertaste y yo no me despido. Hoy entras a mi casa. Gracias. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, Manuel. I mean, you're a poet of such profundity. It's just, just such a privilege to hear the poems. And I had the feeling that it must be costly for you to read them, but of course that's stupid because they're poems. But do you want to talk a little bit about that, about that, the, the link between the personal and the poetic? Yes, I um, I have to say that I, I, I write often, well, at least people have told me that I write two kinds of poems. There are poems that I didn't read today that are about silence and transcendence where I have references to Arvo Pear and, and reference to, to, to a spiritual poetry and stuff like that. And there are other poems like these ones where I am also trying to refer to the spiritual, but through the everyday things. And um, I have to say that the shift uh, was the shift from this only spiritual poetry to this other poetry with the everyday was the, was the birth of my daughter. Because I was, a, for lack of a better way to say it, I, I, I am able to see transcendence when I see her. And she is this human just made out of flesh. And, and, and she has all of the circumstantial problems that, that, that we can have, you know. Um, but, but I see transcendence there. So I started writing these poems that are reaching for, for, some, for the invisible, but through the visible. I am not in, 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 in that existential need that I had before of referring to, to the work of you know, some musicians, for example. I was always talking about Eric Satie or Arvo Pear or, or, or some Debussy, but, 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 I, but now the silence of the house or, or the noise of the house is a revelation of the same things. Um, so these poems that I, that I read right now, where I talk about my grandmother, I, I talk about my father, I talk, is, is um, they are the result of a different kind of enlightening, I think. It, it's, it's, uh, the epiphanies are coming from different places and they are coming from, from everyday places. Uh, so it's, it's a recognition of the poetic in the everyday. Um, and this, I also thing that has made me look at the world and my experience in, 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 in the world in a different way. Because now I am expecting the invisible to jump out of things. Um, it is always there. So I, I, I don't think um, that there is a separation now between the personal and the poetic. It is just the ability to articulate it, but the poetic is always there. Mm. 
So there's a real centered sense, a real sense of gravitas in your poetry. And one wonders what if, you know, if the way you thought about the world and thought about the world in poetry and the arrival of your daughter kind of coincided and moved you into this territory, could you imagine a another life event in sort of 10 years time that would produce an, a sort of another or related or an unrelated kind yes, of well, growth? Well, well, something else happened, um, which was the pandemic for me. Um, and of course pandemic, you had COVID, didn't you? Yes, I did have COVID. I had COVID and I lost uh, three very close friends that were my age too, um, due to COVID. And, many people in Mexico, like I'm going back to Mexico in, in two months, I hope, and I'm going back uh, to not see many friends. Mm. I'm going back uh, to people I said goodbye without knowing that I said goodbye to them last time we saw each other. Like, and this is the experience of, of, of many others, but this, uh, the possibility of dying was, uh, a life-changing experience for me. Um, I was not very ill when I got COVID, but I was, I had this disease at the same time that friends that died. And I had a little bit of this survivor's guilt, you know, because there was not many reasons why it wasn't me. And now um, I hear what uh, Sodeep is telling us in New Delhi. This, this is an experience that makes us aware of the fragility of everything, the fragility of our societies, the fragility of our economics, the fragility of our bodies. Uh, only the non-tangible is not fragile. And, and that is what makes poetry uh, blast. Uh, as fragile as it seems, it is the strongest because it goes beyond us and it goes beyond our bodies, even though it comes from it and, 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 and even though it nourishes itself from it. Um, so this, this experience made me take decisions. For example, there is in a poem that I read, the one about my daughter, the letter, mm -hmm. the last verse of that poem is a very open, I love you. Mm -hmm. And when I wrote that verse, I immediately took my pencil back and I said, am I gonna finish a poem with an I love you? In what kind of poetry workshop would they let me finish a poem with an I love you? You know, that is the first thing that they when I raise. You, you don't say I love you, poet. You, you, you make the I love you show up in poetry without saying it. But the truth is that I love you has been written many times from one lover to another, not from one father to a daughter. And to my daughter, I don't want to give her a metaphor of love. I want to tell her I love her. Mm. So this was this was a decision that took me months and, and a lot of discussion with poet friends. This was, I, I got serious discussions with friends about this last verse. How do you dare to write I love you? But when talking in this personal poem to my daughter, how I dare not? This was... This was important. So this, in this case, this poem was a life decision because when I decided to publish this poem, I didn't know if I was going to survive the pandemic. And this really was a message for her. And if I need to say, I love you, I'm gonna say, I love you. And I, the other Manuel, the Manuel that existed four, three years ago would have never finished a poem like that. But this was a, not, not just a poetic decision, it was an ethical decision. Mm. And I decided that that was the end that this poem needed. I don't know what is gonna happen with the critic in a hundred years, but I hope that Olivia smiles when she reads it, and that's it. Manuel, you, you, you say these things beautifully and very articulate, articulately and very wisely. Your poems are wise. Uh, there are so many things I want to say, but 
I want to emphasize that in spite of all this elevated wisdom, what comes across in your poetry is also a sense of innocence, that you're vulnerable, that you're open to things, that you're open to receive new metaphors or you're open to recalibrate the same metaphor just, just as you did I love you in a way that it has not been done before. If, if I can tell you a very quick personal story, there is another poem where I say that I would like to be pregnant. You remember that one? Mm -hmm. And look that in was, the chat because someone says, first time I ever heard a man express that desire, Mary Louise yeah, says. Yeah, hi. well, but, I, 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 I hesitated a lot <laughs> in making that confession um, because I'm not only a male poet, I'm also a male Mexican poet. And, you know, that, that confession, you know, that I have that envy, even there is a loving envy, you know, but knowing that I, it does not matter how I love my, how much I love my daughter. I will never share that bond with her. I don't know what is to have her within my body and to nourish her from my body. That very physical bond, I will never know. It will always be a mystery to me. It's in that confession is, is that vulnerability that you say. And it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a little scary. When I read that first, that, that poem for the first time, in public, I was a little scared of ridicule, but I'm always. Manuel, it's, it's funny that you say that because I've written a poem exactly, you know, I wanted to know what it is like to be a pregnant and I did write it way back. And I, uh, I gave it to my mother, you know, I didn't know who else to give it to. And she's a feminist, she's no more sadly, but she's a, she was a feminist. And even she said, this was rather bold. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you know, but I want to come back to your poetry. Just one last thing before we move on is the sound of your poetry. Mm -hmm. We had the privilege of seeing both the English as well as the, the Spanish side by mm -hmm. side, which was very, very useful. When I was hearing you, you read both English and the Spanish fabulously well. So that's the first thing. But when I heard you read in English, and then when you were reading in Spanish, two things struck me. One, of course, is Spanish, the pace of uttering the phrase is much more swifter, it's faster. Mm -hmm. Second, I realized also that the way you were reading the English poems was so much in the tradition of Americans reading at readings. And I'm wondering where do you reconcile this? Because also <laughs> parallel to this I saw <laughs> Yeah, I was wondering how you answer this, but also parallel to this I saw was the way you mix a very old tradition with the Christian tradition and the Western yes. tradition. Clearly you come from Mexico, life after life, like in my part of the world, Nirvan is very, very something that we live with, you know, there will be birth after uh, death. Absolutely. And at the same time, you know, there's an end to life if you're talking about Western thought. Just address these two different things. Absolutely. Right? Um, the, the poem about my father is, is an elegy and a welcome, right? So the idea that he's coming in, in that, I think that it was very cultural. The day that my father died, I, I came home and I told my wife, well, not, now he's here. Because when he was alive, I knew that he was far away. But now that he does not belong to the body, he is here and he's watching his granddaughter He's watching us. He's in the house. He's not far. He was far when he was alive. Uh, but this, but this is a notion that comes uh, very close to me because of the day of the death and, and all of this. We do celebrate that. We do have an altar. Um, I do think sometimes that I talk to my dad. You know, not like having visions or anything, but we we converse. Um, and I do believe that in the same way that these two notions exist uh, in myself, um, these two different ways of reading uh, in English and Spanish uh, are also the result of living across the two cultures. It's funny because when I read in Spanish, I do not read as in the singy way of 
uh, Mexican poets do. Right. But in English, being my second language, I feel too unsecure to innovate very much. <laughs> so I do read in a slower pace than regular poets. Um, because I do also believe in poetry as a form of prayer. So I like the sense of slowness in a poem. I, I, I like to give space to each word in, in the poem. Um, but I, I am sometimes betrayed by my, by my, by my ears. Um, I tend to imitate the accent of the people around me anywhere I go. Um, I studied music before and sometimes my ear betrays me. I, I cannot avoid it. So if I am in a reading and everybody's reading in a certain form, I have to consciously move away from it because I would naturally just go on that flow. My, my ear is like that. I don't know if it's, I just want to blend in which is difficult um, being the, the, the one Mexican poet uh, all the time in Cincinnati. Um, but yes, I think that those things happen. Thank you for that. An extraordinarily just beautiful and thought provoking reading. Thank you so much. We're just having a wonderful afternoon and equally wonderfully. Thank you so much, Manuel. Thank you. Now we're going to turn to Knut Odegaard. Um, yeah. It's a great privilege and uh, to welcome Knut to whom I have met in many countries at many festivals and have always admired his poetry, which has tremendous range. And his, his biography is very distinguished and also has enormous range. So um, let me tell you what it says. Uh, Knut Odegaard was born in Mold, Norway in 1945, and he's reading from Mold tonight. He lives partly in Iceland and partly in Norway. His first poetry collection was published in 1967 and there have been 16 subsequently. He writes novels, children's books, he's written a play, essays, other books of nonfiction and translated 14 collections of foreign poetry. He is himself the most widely translated poet in modern Norwegian literature. His poems have appeared as books in 43 languages. He studied theology in university and philology at university, and after that became the managing director of a publishing company, was the cultural and cinema director of Christiansund town in Norway, and the cultural director of the county of Sur Trundelag, also obviously in Norway. And then he was managing director of the Nordic Publishing House in Reykjavik. He's been a literary critic in the leading Norwegian newspaper, Aftenposten, and on the key newspaper Vartland. In 1989, Erdegaard was appointed a Norwegian state scholar by the Parliament of Norway. He's a founder and was president for 10 years of the Norwegian International Festival of Literature. And since then, he's been honorary president. He's been a member of the board of the Norwegian Society of Authors and Society of Critics, vice president of the Norwegian Literary Council, secretary general of the European Academy of Poets and member of the board of Norwegian Pen. In 1993, he celebrated the first uh, foreign festival poet at the St. Magnus Festival in Orkney in Scotland, um, the festival founded by Peter Maxwell Davis. From 2003 to 2014, he was president of the Bjornstern Bjornsson Academy for Literature and Freedom of Expression. In 2015, he was appointed a member of the Norwegian Academy. Not surprisingly, given all this work for literature and culture, as well as his writing, he was knighted by the King of Norway in 1997, has received several honours, awards and distinctions from Norway and other countries. They include the commander with star of the Icelandic Order of the Falcon, the commander of the papal equestrian order, the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem. In 2001, he was awarded the greatest cultural prize of Norway, the Anders Yara Cultural Prize. In 2007, the Slovak International Prize for Poetry, the Jan Schmreck. In 2009, the gold medal and first prize for poetry in Taiwan. 2001, the Swedish Academy awarded him the Doblut Prize for his poetry. In 2014, the Great Serbian Award, Kiev Smederevo. And 2015, the Romanian International Prize of Poetry. And in Kosovo, in 2016, the Golden Grape. He has an honorary D. Lit from Mexico. And in 2017, the Mongolian State University instituted him as honorary professor of literature. 
and he received the International Prize of Ulaanbaatar. From 95 to 97, Knut Erdegaard was honorary consul for the Republic of Macedonia, of Slovakia, and in 1997, he became the honorary consul general for the Republic of Macedonia in Norway. It's a position he still holds. So Knut Erdegaard is a tremendous force for poetic inspiration and literary activity and for international cooperation, and it's therefore just a joy to welcome him this afternoon. Knut, welcome. Welcome Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, I'm not sure about this um, technique. I can't see my own face. I think I can see Sue Deep on my screen. Yes, you should be able to see yourself as the main speaker now. And I think your poems will be projected beside okay. your face by Dom. Yes, very good. Yeah. Um, thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, I'm so happy to, to meet all of you. Uh, uh, and um, uh, I think this evening I would like to, to read some poems from my poetry book, which was published in Norwegian in uh, 2017, uh, Tida Inne is the Norwegian title. Can you see it? Yes. And um, uh, the time is in, the time is here. Uh, as you can see this, uh, this cover, it is a painting, very famous painting by Edvard Munch, our, our uh, greatest Norwegian painter. Uh, it's an old man with a uh, watch here and the bed and uh, the time is in. Uh, also many of the poems are about aging, about uh, um, and me as an old man, after all I am 75, um, death, death is coming closer, the body is not functioning as it did when I was 20, uh, my mind is not so uh, quick as it, as, as it once was. Uh, but I find it uh, very interesting to follow my own uh, uh, aging and um, how uh, this last part of life can be um, very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. So, um, um, as I have to choose some few uh, um, poems, I will read most of them in just in English, but two of them uh, will be in, <clears throat> in, uh, in Norwegian. So I am happy that you can see uh, the English uh, poems all the time on the screen because I am I'm not so fluent as an English um, reader. So the first one, time. Time comes onto the stage now, stands a little at first and hesitates, looks closely at the door plate in the house, a backdrop there on the stage to make sure it is the right place, rings and I open, then the time is in. The stage curtain falls, it shines on moon and stardust trickles from the curtain, which is the universe's glowing groan. The curtain glides up again, and there stands the eternal clown, also shrieking newborn baby on the stage, while time falls down for applause. Then the time is out. The next one is this uh, uh, poem I call Mor or Mother in, in English. I uh, forgot to say that the translations are all uh, by uh, Brian McNeil and we are hoping that uh, this volume will be published in, in England, uh, maybe this year or next year. So here is Mother. I have a mother in a blue coat. 
She takes my hand. I am small. I am afraid. She leads me. The cult is sown with stars. The snow is so high here when we walk in the Milky Way, when no snow is cleared. She and I. And uh, then comes a poem which I will read in uh, Norwegian called uh, Haustkveld in Norwegian, also Autumn Evening. And <clears throat> I think I have to tell you a little bit about this poem because it is so that many of my readers think that uh, my poetry is <laughs> kind of biography, but it is not, it's fiction. Um, uh, I use, of course, parts of uh, my own biography, other people's biographies, etc. Uh, I use life and also literature in my uh, um, creation of, of poetry. So uh, I hope that I most of the time um, has the ability to to. Yes, to be a voice for the voiceless is to, to, to be a voice for the smallest ones. And the, in this poem, it is the, the one child uh, from a, a, a family who was on the wrong side during the World War II, uh, who is mobbed by, by the, other, the other, other children. And, uh, I knew this boy very well. He ended, decided to end his life. So that was it. So, haust kveld. Vi stod en haust kveld med de små tissene våre og tissene om kapp opp skoleveggen i Molde. Det sømde en måne i fjorden under oss. Det gjaldt å tisse høyst opp. Da vendte en spruten mot meg, og tisse på meg ropte, Hitler er død. Jeg ble for fjamsa og tisse tilbake på han, og svara, Hitler er død. Ja, ropte de andre, og alle tisse på meg, og far din skal dø, far din skal dø. De tisse og tisse til jeg seg ned der, framfor skuleveggen, gjennom våt av uril. Det gikk fra meg, jeg var liten og tynn, og haustkvelden mørkna over meg. Månen dreiv i fjorden, hvit med buken opp i svart vatten. And then uh, a, a poem uh, called Prest, Priest. Uh, um, um, it was my, my uncle, yes, he was a priest, and his name was Knut, like, like my name. So. <laughs> uncle Knut was a priest. He was a practical man. Latin was Greek to him. He died after his retirement. He stood and dug the site for the new house when his heart gave way after Easter. He was more an electrician than a preacher. He began his speeches by saying, I am not much of a one for speeches. And he was right about that. He did not really have much to teach his parishioners. They had their own troubles with their births, their, with their low and their death. And he did not have words for such things. But he had learned how to repair electric wires. And he visited people in their homes and mended short circuits and defective fuse boxes. He screwed lamps into place 
and where he had been, there was light. And um, then comes a poem about uh, me and my wife, the old couple. It's many of the poems in this book is about us, about the old couples. Uh, this is the, the one I, I will read tonight for you. It's called Soon There. We began to talk about death yesterday. A little embarrassed, we changed the subject at once. We both need a little siesta in the afternoon now. I'm not as wide awake as we used to be. I dozed beside you in our bed. You under your quilt, I under mine. And in half sleep, I thought that soon now all of our friends will be gone. And then I said, do you, do you think that now we will soon be there? Arrived? Gone? Did you fall asleep before me? You didn't say anything. We went for an evening walk before the sun turned black and sank under the sea surface. We old ones don't have much left in our trousers anymore, I thought, as we walked. The trouser legs flap over twigs and air in the wind, over our shoes, so heaven light we are. Our love is indeed more than wind and dust and twigs in the wind, I say idiotically. And you take my hand. Now, when the night comes tumbling over us. And uh, I would like to, as my last poem, uh, read uh, in Norwegian a poem called Skuggar, in English, Shadows. I don't think we have that on the screen yet. It's about... Um, about John, are you there? Yes, there we are. It's also uh, part of my um, my life work in a way. I've been working very much for refugees, and um, in some of, some few of my poems, I have allowed myself to be well a bit maybe politically, uh, but uh, I am most interested in in the individuals in the in the in the in the in the uh, in the people whom I can see, whom I can feel, whom I can share the compassion with. So, shadows, skuggar. Da månen hade kvest seg sylskarp på stjernehimmelen, kraup dig som ormar ut av det fuktige kjellarmørkret, og helt seg tett inn mot restene av murvegger, i Aleppo by, mest usynlige skuggevesen i mørke kler. Det er ikke regn av klasebomber, glasgård, spikerer over det nå. De lister seg fram, og Mariam ammer barnet hun fødte på murgolvet. De kom med profetiske ord, og reiv av henne klea, trengde inn i henne alle stader, en etter en til hun lå der blant døde og halvdøde. Det er bare skugger og rester av bål 
sur blå svart oske i skogkanten. Mariam ammar sin farlause son. De listas exakt ut av luktene av stram urin, svette och rottnande matrester från rotte ögon som skein i båle de hade tänt av sammanbrotna möbler på stengolvet. I månskinet vicklar de sig ut av en väldig spindelväv som klistrar sig till dig. Där de slit sig ut av väven med flugevänger och mygglande matrester i de klistne trådarna. Grönt månlys, grönt månlys. Det är rögo som lyser i grönt månskinn i utkanten av en småby. Nu hänger det upp klesfilder på snorer. Det är sträckt ut med de tre här. Mariam fuggle tynn skugge. Papirlös i sig färd väck från källarmörker. Mariams magre fötter. Det går genom örken. Sann, sann i hudporene. Sann, lite mjölk i brysta händer som trör i örkenen. Men sonen tejer, inte mat, inte vatten, inte värn, 40 grader, hete, sol, lågor. Och detta följde känd till en strand där Europa kisklar och lockar i böljer för andra sidan. Och minnes ord om ett lova land av mjölk och honung. Och pressar fram av sårskorpen i munnen en smil till gutten. Mjölk, mjölk, honning, syng ho för han. Och såra åpnas att i läppen henne blodet dryp i sand. Där kom dit en natt utan månens skyn. Där var ett pigg trojäre där skar och kua sig på. Där kom till en strand där böljen är kvistel av Europa. Inte krig, inte svolt, inte valtäck. Mjölk, mjölk och honning och deg, barn är mitt, sång Maria. Månelös natt och det skrek i mörkret. Menneskeröjster som rågfull som ull. Toa dig vart borte den natta. På morgonen kom fanns dig to bröd. Dog slängde i busker med utstående nyrer, tomme ögnehåger. Morgon kom. Bilgen är lejka så blå i brisen. När bröderna var borta låg nog en gummibåt. Med betalning kanske åt det tolv som var rätt. Inte tänka nog. Syng jag bär för barnet. Mjölk och mjölk. Och sjön kom vinden med kraftiga tag. Han hugg i båten. Kvälvda mittvägs på havet. Tre av dig nådde inte båtsida med de iskalde fingrarna i sina. De drev bort från dig, Mariam, och barnet sock i sin båtegrav som var grön och mörkna nedover mot havbottnen. Tare och underliga fiskar tog mot dig där det gled ned i havbottnens tussmärker som sakte svartna helt. Och helt den farlöse tätt in mot sina mjölketomme bryst. Tack. Really, really, really enjoyed this, Knut. Thank you, Knut, for... Um silencing us with your poetry of witness um that's that's an extraordinary poem in fact the two po the two sections of your reading were very different from each other weren't they i was thinking how you know nuanced your observation and compassionate a word you used your observation of the people in your life or in your community is and how there's the sense of a whole lifetime so far of experience behind the ambiguity about guilt 
the ambivalence even about death and love and the big things. And then you read us this so different poem of witness that has to change register, I suppose, because it's like no lyric poetry after Auschwitz. You can't speak of other people's horrors without horror. You can't be nuanced or subtle or, 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 or every day if you're grieving somebody else's tragedy. Would that be fair? I write what I, I can see, and uh, I, uh, of course, I couldn't see Mariam. She, she disappeared. She was one of them who, who drowned. Uh, but uh, I have, she, she is a kind of, she, 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 she grew, she was, um, I could see her, I could see her in, in, in my mind, and she became a living, a uh, woman for me, and uh, I knew that she, her name must be Mariam, which is uh, uh, <coughs> the, the Arabic uh, <coughs> uh, word for Mary, as we, we, we say in, uh, in English, and Maria in Norwegian, and, uh, and uh, so it, in a, in a way, can, can combine the, at least three uh, Three uh, um, religions in, in in the Middle East and, and, and Europe. She is she is a victim for for, for this. And uh, um, uh, we have all seen Mariam. I think we 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 don't want to take it too personally in our us. We have to close our borders. We have to say no, not more refugees into, into the kingdom of Denmark, into the kingdom of Norway, into, into the uh, Great Britain and uh, et cetera. But, but they, they are there uh, struggling for their lives. And um, as a, um, human being, also a religious man, I, I think that this is, I, I, I can't, uh, I have to, to, to be a voice uh, for these voiceless uh, people. That's, that's what, what I can, I can't, I can't just silence, you know. Uh, but then the other way, you mentioned this two, um, uh, yeah, yes, two different, maybe, um, Kinds of poetry, I would say that there is more, which is alike. Uh, if you, if I compare with my first poetry books, which is from the sixties, nineteen sixties, which were uh, very very modernistic and uh, complicated uh, language, and I don't understand them myself now when I am reading Knut Odegaard from nineteen sixty seven. I don't, I have problems with understanding this. <laughs> Who is this young man who <laughs> pretends to be so 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 interesting and so 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 now I'm at least uh, I think more and more telling stories. I'm I'm telling you stories. You can you can uh, I'm simple if you can understand what I mean. I'm a simple language. I I, I don't um, claim the, the, my readers to to have. A, academic background or something, I just tell us a story which I hope uh, everybody can understand something. So mm. Well, very uh, much. And it's interesting, that's almost an ethical imperative for you. Mm. Knut, uh, one of the things that comes across is uh, in spite of the fact that you say so yourself that now you're telling stories, but the simplicity is embedded and packed with years of distilled wisdom. That comes across really, really sharply in your poetry, which we are all grateful for. The other thing that struck me was, you know, you have this duality of me, my own voice inside and what is outside, almost like 
as if I was seeing uh, wait, waiting for Godot again. But you know, that's the stage I imagine Vladimir and Estragon. You know, your your a partner is the other person, and then there's this sort of you both are saying the same thing, but you're in a sense contradicting each other. But contradiction uh, is basically the other side of agreement. So talk about your the duality, which is so beautifully brought across in your poetry. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I think that's it. that's what I I'm trying also to 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 show. And uh, there's another thing I would uh, mention that is uh, I am more and more satisfied with my my small uh, village. It's it's a big enough uh, stage for me. This small village, uh, Molden. Far up in the north and the west, uh, uh, far away from almost <laughs> everything. That's that's the the center of the world, I would say. For, as for me, because here is everything happening. Here is um, the birth. Here is the the law. Here is the hate. Here is the death. Here is the sun. Here is the stars. Here is the moon. Here is uh, uh, the, the good and the bad hearts, here, here is everything. So we, we don't need to, to be so sophisticated in choosing uh, um, landscapes or scenes or, or, or stages, I think, for, for poetry, if, if you want to, to express what is real human. Real human. Yes. Witness and testimony, it's been a real theme this afternoon, hasn't it, in poetry? Mm, yes, yes, yes. Yes, uh, yeah, it was just, um, you know, it's also been sort of universally moving, all three of you. Very, very rarely that, you know, you have three such different poets across different languages, but you're able to move the listener in a, such a profound and deep way. Mm. And, uh, because we're coming to the end of our uh, session, perhaps let me just read three lines from, um, from um, a poet I admire a lot, Cheshraf Ches Milosh. And I'm reading these three lines because after this, perhaps I can request all of you to just close our eyes for 10 seconds, that's all, for a secular prayer for people dying in India, the Colombian government shooting their own people, the helicopters, people in Mexico, all over the world, both public and private grief. But Milosh, the last line of Milosh is just so transcendental. Just let me just read this. My generation was lost, cities too, and nations. But all this, a little later. Meanwhile, in the window, a swallow. Hope. Hope is a thing with feathers, right, Dickinson? Um, let's just pray secularly for 10 seconds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. And thank you to everybody who's taken part uh, this afternoon. Thank you to everyone who assists, as the French say, by, by coming and listening month after month or for the first time. Thank you to three extraordinary poets, Pierre Taftrup, Manuel Iris, Knut Erdegaard. Thank you to Don Krieger, who drives technically, and greetings across the ocean and the land masses to Shadeep. Thank you all very much for a wonderful Thank you. afternoon. Thank you. It was a real, real treat and a real, you know, a dose of hope for so many of us. Thank you. And just extraordinary work, really extraordinary work. So with that, good night. It's 10, 10, 10 past 10 in Delhi at night. Time for a late dinner. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Thank you.
Thank Till you. the next time. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.